Good morning, everyone. As we have on the 19th of every month, tomorrow we will be lowering the flags to half mass to honor the 107 Vermonters we've lost to COVID. For months, we were fortunate here in Vermont, not seeing our number of deaths rise. But as we see more cases, we see more deaths. And though it is a number that keeps ticking up, we must all remember, these are not just numbers. These are people, mothers, fathers, grandparents, someone's best friend, or a well-known community member. Their life had value. And however long it might have been, it was ended by this virus. And the more the virus spreads, sadly, the more deaths we'll continue to see. This is why we must stay committed to our work and make the sacrifices to keep our loved ones safe. And I know you've been doing just that because while our case counts remain high, they're not growing like they were a few weeks ago. We're not seeing increases from Thanksgiving like other states are. And our travel-related cases are declining. What you're doing is working, and we need to keep it up. Because even though a plateau is promising news, the virus continues to spread among older, more at-risk Vermonters. However, due to the continued number of high cases, unfortunately, I don't have good news today regarding school-based and recreational sports. It's still my hope that in the coming days and weeks, we'll see these high numbers drop so we can scale back on some of our restrictions in both sports and household gatherings. But to do that, we have to continue to do all we can to slow this down, like limiting contact with others and wearing a mask. Looking at the bright side, since I last stood at this podium, high-risk healthcare workers across the state have started receiving the COVID vaccine. And by the time I see you next Tuesday at our press conference, vaccinations in long-term care facilities will have begun with staff and our seniors getting the vaccine, which is incredibly important and one of my highest concerns. As I've said, vaccines will help us beat the virus and begin our return to normal. And while it's a huge milestone, we need to remember just because a vaccine exists doesn't mean we can let our guard down. It will still be several more months before the vaccine starts to lower the infection rate of the virus and we have enough people vaccinated. I know how disruptive this has been and how ready Vermonters are to move past this difficult time in our history. But unfortunately, we're just not there yet. So I'm asking for your perseverance for just a little while longer because we still have a ways to go. And due to the success we've had, it's important we continue to deal with this pandemic as we have since March watching the data and listening to the science. As it's Friday, Secretary French is joining us remotely to update uh, on the uh, surveillance testing program in schools, and we'll provide a look ahead to after the holidays. As well, Secretary Curley is here to speak about what we've done to support Vermont's businesses through the pandemic so they can survive during this difficult time and make recovery possible down the road. Like many states, we're closely watching what's happening in Washington around a second stimulus package. And I want to assure you, um, Vermont's delegation is working very hard on this issue. But with the end of some unemployment benefits ending shortly, along with other programs from the first round of funding, I'm hopeful we'll have some good news in the very near future. Now, finally, uh, to continue with our effort to highlight acts of kindness, service, and goodwill happening throughout Vermont, I want to talk about Troy Austin of Essex Junction, who was nominated by several Vermonters. For the past six years, Troy has run a toy drive to help make sure kids in his community have something to look forward to during the holiday season. With COVID throwing a wrench in many traditions this year, Troy got creative. Uh, to make sure the drive could be done safely. So he organized a drive through event, and last weekend, the people of Essex stepped up, with hundreds of cars coming through and over 1,000 toys donated.
Troy also made it a show, as you might have seen on, on the news, lighting up his vehicle and others doing the same as an added attraction. His nominator said that Troy is always thinking about how he can help others. One said that, in addition to the Troy Drive, Troy spends much of his spare time creating events and activities that bring smiles to the faces of others all year round. Uh, Troy is an example of how Vermont lights the way. So I want to thank him and all those who have donated and supported his efforts this year and in years past. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary Curley. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, everyone. I think I can say at this point in the year, May sure seems like a long time ago, but it was just seven months ago, almost to the day, that we proposed our first economic recovery package to the legislature. After working with them to pass a recovery bill, we then had to develop the infrastructure to deliver the money directly to businesses and aid their survival through this pandemic. We proposed two more relief packages in June and August, offering grants and programs that supported economic spending. We listened to the business community and with each proposal tried to evolve programs to reflect the realities on the ground. Now, seven months later, the last of those federal dollars are being distributed to businesses across the state. As I speak, checks are being sent and businesses will begin to see the final grant dollars early next week. All told, between ACCD and our outstanding partner in this process, the Vermont Department of Taxes, around $300 million has been granted to small businesses to keep them afloat during these trying times. Over these seven months, we've grown used to talking about dollar amounts in the hundreds of millions instead of the hundreds of thousands. Prior to the pandemic, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development could never have imagined developing systems to equitably and securely grant hundreds of millions of dollars so quickly. During the same period, ACCD also launched housing and rental assistance programs, buy local campaigns, regional marketing grants, cross-state travel educational efforts, and ski safety grants to help our resorts open safely. It has been an incredible and historic effort, and I must thank all of our ACCD staff and the Department of Tax staff who made this happen. I also want to thank the other state agencies who lent us their staff to vet thousands of applications from businesses seeking financial relief. I can tell you what kept us all going and what will continue to keep us going is, this, is knowing that this work helps Vermonters in need. Vermont businesses create stability in our communities, they employ Vermonters, and they unlock the arts and culture, outdoor recreation, and tourism opportunities our state is known for. They draw new residents to our state, residents that we so desperately need to reverse our demographic trends. So while this phase of business support is coming to a close, the pandemic continues, and we know our work is not done. If more money comes, from the federal government, we stand ready to again evolve and continue the programs we have established. We also look forward to our work with the legislature to ensure our business community is supported in their long-term recovery as we get to the other side of this. But until we know more about the federal funds and until the legislature reconvenes, we are asking all Vermonters to continue to support our local businesses. Be kind to each other, wear a mask, and follow the guidelines in place. These workers, including healthcare workers, hospitality, and restaurant workers, are serving you in these trying times. Please support them by following their safety procedures without question, tipping service workers, and always trying to buy local when you can. In fact, there is a last minute, if there is a last minute gift that you are looking for, go to buyvermontmade.com. Our Department of Tourism and Marketing has created a great resource to help you shop local. And for those who wait till the very last minute, 
a gift card to your favorite restaurant will go a long way in ensuring that all of our favorite restaurants can stay open in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, and with that, I will turn it over to Secretary French. November data from our monthly survey uh, to school districts that tells us the extent schools are using in-person, uh, remote, or uh, hybrid learning. This is the third time we've administered the survey. Uh, the first time was at the end of September, uh, which reflected the modes of learning schools were using uh, when they reopened for the year. The October survey captured our shift uh, to step three in our guidance, which gave schools a few more tools to support in-person instruction. And October's data reflected that shift with almost a 50% increase in in-person instruction at the elementary level. The latest survey results are from November are when case counts of the virus were increasing rapidly in the region. Um, also, uh, the data represents a time of some uncertainty in our schools, where, which we're starting to adapt to the prospect of Thanksgiving, uh, the first major holiday of the season. In spite of these challenges, uh, the November data from the survey largely remained unchanged from October. 14% of our students uh, were in complete remote learning mode, 33% uh, in person mode, and 53% still the majority in, in a hybrid learning mode. We think the stability in the data from October to November shows that schools have been successful in switching among the modes with the increased case counts that came in November and also despite the logistical challenges such as staff availability. The data also show that the distribution of the modes of learning <clears throat> continues to vary depending on the grade level of the students. In high schools, about 10% of the students were in complete in-person mode. At the middle level, there was double the rate at about 20% of the students in in-person. In just over 50% of our elementary schools were in complete in-person mode during the month of November. The survey <clears throat> admittedly is administered at the end of each month at one point in time. And we know that schools shift among the modes uh, during the month in reaction to health conditions and the logistical considerations. But the stability in the data indicates our schools have put considerable effort behind maintaining continuous operations and have been very successful in that regard. Uh, more information about the survey and its results can be found on the Agency of Education's website. We also have a map there that shows the trends in the data from a geographic perspective. We are now into the second week of our December surveillance testing for COVID-19 among school staff. During the month of December, we're testing 25% of our schools each week, and the weekly sample includes schools from all around the state. This means we're testing about 5,000 school staff each week. The participation rate in the testing is still about 40%, but we are seeing the participation rate increase in more districts. Uh, the number of districts that had a participation rate of greater than 50% doubled uh, this week as compared to the prior week. The positivity rate from the testing of school staff remains very low. Before Thanksgiving, uh, we tested about 9,300 staff and the positivity rate uh, was 0.26%. From the period after Thanksgiving, um, as of this Monday, December 14th, uh, we've administered approximately 6,000 tests and the positivity rate remains very low at 0.1%. The positivity rate from our surveillance testing school staff is much lower than the statewide positivity rate, which is about 2%. We intend to continue the surveillance testing in January uh, to continue uh, to monitor the prevalence of the virus in our communities. Looking ahead, uh, we are planning on uh, an initiative uh, to start the next phase of our response uh, to the emergency in K-12 education, uh, which we are calling the recovery phase. Uh, during the month of January, we'll be working to outline a process that requires districts to develop uh, recovery plans. At this point, we think a central feature of those plans will be to leverage an existing organizational structure in education called Educational Support Teams, or ESTs. ESTs in Vermont are typically organized at the school level, uh, but to facilitate a better integration with other state services and to focus our recovery systems on a regional basis, we'll be supporting ESTs being convened at the school district level instead of the school level. 
We will be engaging uh, with our various education partner organizations after the first of the year to develop these planning concepts with an expected launch sometime around February 1st. This timeline is tentative and very dependent on our assessment of public health conditions. But as we move into recovery, uh, we'll be looking for more opportunities to increase in-person instruction, which remains our primary intervention to address the impact of this emergency on students. To that end, uh, we'll continue to monitor the modes of learning through our monthly survey. Uh, in closing, uh, I want to wish everyone a happy holidays. Um, the holiday period has been very challenging for schools from an emergency response perspective, um, but I think our schools have done exceptionally well. And I want to acknowledge the dedicated service of our educational professionals and the cooperation of families that have made it all possible. So thank you. Um, that concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Malik. Thank you, Secretary French, and I want to again commend the entire community of educators for those incredible statistics you provided and for keeping such a safe environment for our kids to be in school. If we look at our total cases in Vermont um, and our deaths, they're illustrated on the screen here. While you see our total case count obviously continuing to increase, I want you to pay attention to the uh, new cases on a daily basis, which clearly are not showing an increase. There is a lot of fluctuation in the data, as I'm sure you'll notice, and they are settling out at higher levels than we are accustomed to here in Vermont, but at the same time, they are uh, not going on an increasing trend. If you look at the COVID-19 uh, tracker website, you'll find that the only two states that are orange, not that orange is the most favorable color, are Hawaii and Vermont. Uh, the rest is really, we are lost in a broad swath of redness. Um, and many, many states are showing continuing increases in their cases on a uh, more exponential growth curve. And I'm just illustrating here that that is not happening here. We are, while we're not going necessarily down, we are at a uh, more of a plateau level. And again, we continue to uh, enjoy, if I may use that word, uh, a very uh, healthy, percent positivity rate in the low 2% range while continuing to do abundant testing within the state, even with the college students now departed. Just wanted to finish by showing you the current list of uh, long-term care facilities and uh, the numbers in their outbreaks. Uh, when you add those numbers up, they're in the high 300s. Many have more favorable news to offer now in terms of things have settled down, but obviously this is a particularly distressing part of the pandemic for Vermont as well as everyone else. I've spent a lot of time in previous press conferences discussing this grouping. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today, just wanted to give you the updated numbers. So we are still being as successful as one can be and being an island in the middle of the continental U.S. And uh, we have the fortitude and commitment of Vermonters to really thank for this. Our own account of deaths that you saw is at 107. I want to stress that not all deaths occur in nursing homes. Some deaths occur outside of nursing homes. And we shouldn't always make the assumption because of the outbreaks that that's where all of the deaths are. Hospitalizations are in the same range, which is always in the 20s. Uh, recently updated in the last hour data tells us we're at 27 with 10 patients in an ICU setting. Although we've learned that some hospitals actually are using the ICU room as a more isolation room setting and the patient is actually not needing all of the services that an ICU would particularly provide. 
The number of outbreaks we are following has grown to 42, 17 of which are in the healthcare sector. In terms of non-outbreak situations, as we call them, they are 223, 58 are healthcare related, 165 are non-healthcare related. I've noticed a concerning trend for many of these situations to be characterized by people who were in public facing situations by virtue of their work at the time when they were infectious. Obviously, they were not aware they were infectious because they had no symptoms during that time period. This indeed is the reason why this virus is such a powerful foe and why we speak so much about avoiding the type of conditions that allow it to succeed against us. Prolonged time indoors, multi-household gatherings, especially when masks are not worn, such as when eating or drinking, and when physical distancing becomes less of a focus. It's also why we are so uh, consistent in our messaging about testing because there are people who are asymptomatic who will learn that they could be infectious uh, by virtue of having done that testing. Since we were last here, I'm happy to say that the COVID-19 vaccination effort in Vermont has begun. Many of you saw the video of the emergency department nurse at UVM Medical Center become the first Vermonter to get the vaccine. That nurse, Cindy Wamgant, said, I'm thankful our amazing team will soon have protection from the virus and we can end this difficult year on a positive note. That moment, both in Vermont and across the country, was a historic step closer to a day when we can all be back together again and feel safe. While that day may be many months away, we still need to be patient as we wait to make sure that those at highest risk are protected now. And while we won't get to watch all the vaccinations that continue over the coming months, like we saw the first one, we can keep this in mind. Every time a Vermonter gets vaccinated, all of us benefit. All hospitals have now received their complete allocation of vaccine for the first week. And they've been busy vaccinating their higher risk healthcare staff over the past several days and today, and many tomorrow. We're providing guidance to hospitals regarding the remaining higher risk healthcare workers who don't work within their walls, but will still need to obtain their vaccine from the hospital in their region. And our pharmacy partners, CVS, Walgreens, and Health Direct, Kinney, are scheduled to begin clinics at long-term care facilities next week. As you know, high-risk healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents are receiving vaccines first as part of Priority Group 1A, and we're still working to finalize Priority Group 1B in the coming weeks, but it will almost certainly involve some combination of people over 65 and people with chronic or immune-compromising conditions. We're awaiting recommendations from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice that meets this weekend and our own vaccine implementation advisory group, which meets uh, in about an hour. We hope to have a practical and rational prioritization scheme that first and foremost focuses on reducing sickness and death, but takes into consideration our other goals of keeping our kids in in-person instruction in schools and protecting our workforce and businesses. In the meantime, Everyone who saw the news knows we got good news again about vaccination. The Moderna platform was endorsed by the FDA's advisory committee, and that agency is expected to provide emergency use authorization sometime today. I mentioned on Tuesday that we have already pre-ordered the Moderna vaccine, and if we, we received the amount we ordered, we could have a total of almost 34,000 doses of both Pfizer and Moderna by the end of this month. These vaccines are similar in that both are messenger RNA, also called mRNA vaccines. Many vaccines put a weakened or inactivated germ into our bodies to trigger an immune response. But mRNA vaccines actually teach our cells how to make a protein 
which is uh, just a small piece of a protein that triggers an immune response inside our bodies against the virus. That immune response, which means we've produced antibodies, is what protects us from getting infected if we should encounter the real virus. Both vaccines have shown similar efficacy levels of near 95%. Some participants in both trials showed a strong immune response leading to side effects, including things like pain at the injection site, fatigue, headache, chills, muscle or joint pain. Differences between the Pfizer and Moderna include Moderna's vaccine does not have to be kept super cold like Pfizer's. Moderna's is used in people 18 and older, whereas Pfizer is 16 and older. Moderna is two 100 microgram doses as opposed to two 30 microgram doses of uh, Pfizer. And Moderna is at a 28 day interval as opposed to the 21 day interval of Pfizer. Now, important as the vaccine is, we must not let this good news drown out how essential it is for us all to stay focused on preventing the spread of COVID. Next week, many will celebrate Christmas. Following week, many will celebrate New Year's. These are holidays that, like Thanksgiving, traditionally center on being with people that we love. I know how hard it is to think of spending another holiday apart. The guidance, though, that is still in place calls for us to avoid social gatherings, and the CDC has said that the safest way to celebrate is to celebrate at home with the people you live with. I hope many of you have made plans with this in mind already, but we still need to remind anyone who does gather to keep it as small as possible, wear masks, keep a six-foot distance, and go outside if you can. Always stay away from others if you're sick. And also plan ahead to get tested right after a gathering and seven days later. And if you gather or travel, plan to quarantine, staying home and away from others either for 14 days or seven days if you test out with a negative test and have no symptoms. Now, I'm not saying this because this is a loophole the fact is, we need to acknowledge that some people will choose these higher risk activities. But if we can encourage them to take these steps, we can still help protect our greater communities from further spread. And please strongly reconsider any gathering that involves a person with underlying medical conditions or an older Vermonter. We know that many of our recent deaths have been in long-term care facilities, as I stated, but these group living facilities aren't the only risk. About 20% of our deaths are older people who die at home or in a hospital. As you know, anyone with a high-risk medical condition is also at risk of severe illness from COVID-19. We need to do everything we can to continue protecting these Vermonters especially. I know how isolating it can be for them, but if they can hold on for that vaccine just a little longer, they hopefully will find it was worth it in the end. We can adapt our holiday celebrations once again to stay safe, whether it's connecting virtually with others, leaving cookies on doorsteps, driving around to look at holiday decorations, spending time in the snow, writing cards, or donating to those in need. We can practice random acts of kindness, like shoveling a neighbor's driveway or delivering food, books, games to families in quarantine. There's no question we're still asking Vermonters to give up a lot right now, but I hope the spirit of the season will remind us about what's really important and help us look forward to a new year that will change our lives for the better. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now turn it over to uh, questions. Can you start with Calvin? Yes. Uh, thank you, Governor. So, as you probably saw, um, the newest job report uh, says that unemployment here in the state is down to about 3.1%, which 
appears to be kind of encouraging news. I'm just kind of wondering what, what your thoughts are on the latest uh, yeah. numbers, as, especially as we continue through the winter. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't think it's still reflective of what's really actually happening on the ground. As I said before, the formula is flawed in some respects, uh, especially during the pandemic. So um, I wouldn't read too much into that. While it's uh, somewhat good news, it looks stable. Um, we know uh, that we have some challenges uh, with those who are, are still unemployed. Uh, we have, you know, 20 over 20,000 people unemployed at this point in time. Uh, we're only a, a week or two away, if uh, no action is taken in Congress, uh, that they will lose their benefits. So that isn't really reflective in the data. So I would not read too much into it at this point in time. And if, uh, you know, as you said, it appears Congress is, is making way on, on some sort of deal, you know, there's rumblings of what's in it, but it appears that PUA could be extended. Uh, maybe this is more of a question for Commissioner Harrington, but if PUA is extended, um, will there be a gap in benefits, and how long is that gap yeah. going to be? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm not sure that uh, Commissioner Harrington can answer that. Uh, because it all depends what they do in Congress. Um, and I've been speaking to, I had a conversation with uh, Senator Sanders as well as Senator Leahy over the last two days about uh, uh, the, uh, the stimulus uh, package as well as the, the, the budget bill uh, that is, uh, I, I'm there thinking that it's going to be lumped together and hopefully passed over, uh, over the next couple of days. Um, but it really is in the details of what they do if they make it retroactive. Um, I've advocated for them not to make too many changes in how it's derived, um, because as you remember, uh, we had to go through a lot of work uh, to, to create a program so that we could distribute the funds. Our 50-year-old our mainframe uh, that's antiquated uh, couldn't handle uh, the change. I mean, it's just for traditional unemployment and any change whatsoever will, uh, will uh, you know, slow things down immensely. So we had to create programs outside of that, IT programs outside of the mainframe to distribute these funds. So if they can keep it to the same type of structure, uh, if, they, if they're done, if they, uh, I would imagine they would be retroactive, but I don't know that. It could be a new program starting at a certain date. So we'll wait uh, until it's passed and then uh, be able to get those details. And then just one last question, too. Um, I understand uh, earlier this week you were on a call with uh, President-elect Biden. Um, just I'm wondering if you could kind of shed some light on what came out of the call and what it was like. Yeah, I was, uh, I was on a call with other governors, um, about uh, at least half the other governors across, uh, across the U.S. were on the call as well. Um, and uh, we just got a glimpse of, of what it was going to look like. Uh, he, uh, President-elect Biden, as well as uh, Vice President-elect uh, Harris, um, had said, you know, they're, they're ready to work with us in any way that we, they can. Uh, the open door policy, uh, if anything uh, that uh, uh, they can do to help. And, and understanding the first 100 days is going to be important, especially with the pandemic. Uh, many governors uh, had advocated for making sure there is a smooth transition. Uh, this is too important a time uh, to inflict politics. I think we all get that, uh, at least on the, uh, on the governor level, and uh, making sure that we take care of our constituents, our states, and uh, knowing that we're all different and our needs are different. But again, I thought it was a, a positive uh, hour, hour and a half of, uh, of time uh, spent with them. And uh, they, can, they said that they hope to, uh, to continue uh, this process of engaging with the governors on a regular basis. So I thought it was all good news. Thank you. Steve? Uh, Governor, not to be a, a negative Nelly, but uh, with this huge snowstorm and uh, the ski area is uh, really enthusiastic about uh, the weekend and everything. Um, I was in the southern part of the state yesterday and actually had several people come up to me and say, look at all these people that have just come in in the last couple of days. Um, you know, they're walking around town and everything. So that it doesn't sound like a lot of folks are using that um, or heeding the, uh, the advice to uh, quarantine. Yeah, well, again, this is uh, the same in every state. Uh, whether it's Massachusetts or New York or Vermont, uh, we all have quarantine requirements coming into the state. Uh, I'm not naive. Um, I understand uh, that there are going to be some who aren't going to adhere to our guidance. 
um, but I don't want us to read too much into this as well uh, because we don't know just because you see a license plate that is from a different state we don't know how long they've been here uh, we have allowed travel into the state as long as they quarantine uh, they may have decided uh, that they were going to work remotely uh, for the next month and if a quarantine in their second home and and uh, that's all good uh, and that's we encourage that uh, because uh, because it's good to get outside and we've also haven't found that there's been any uh, transmission uh, in in the ski areas uh, and we continue to advocate as we did during the summer uh, if you're going to be active stay outside be active here yeah, it's, it's safer there um, and we have to remember too uh, that uh, I don't imagine all of the college students went home uh, some of them have uh, they have uh, their their apartments and so forth uh, here in Vermont and uh, they probably want to take advantage of the skiing as well they have uh, plates that are from another state and they could be here so I guess let's just all take a deep breath uh, let's be cautious let's be careful uh, let's make sure that we wear a mask stay uh, physically distanced and uh, and continue to be as safe as possible uh, but um, but again it's with mixed emotions that we receive that snowstorm uh, in years past we would have been celebrating and uh, probably declaring a holiday as a result but um, but this year is different and we have to just be careful and it sounded like Commissioner Smith might be celebrating that holiday but anyway um are there are there plans in place as far as uh, if there was a breakout uh, at at a ski area or or anything like that is there something that we can reassure the public uh, well again we, just, we will we will continue to monitor the monitor the data uh, whatever we see and we will we will take steps depending on, on what we see on the ground what we see uh, with any outbreak uh, in the state and take action and i know you know we have to remember as well the ski areas uh, want to make sure it's a safe environment uh, for their employees uh, they care about their employees uh, but also their reputation uh, because they don't want to be shut down either so uh, they have strict uh, uh, requirements in place regulations uh, they are doing their best i believe uh, to make sure that uh, everyone's adhering to that uh, but if we have an outbreak uh, we will deal with it just like we do any other outbreak and, and finally, uh, the ski areas themselves, I don't know if Commissioner Curley, but the, the ski areas themselves have these things in place. Um, do they also have something in place in case they do have a problem? Well, they know uh, that they can come to us uh, and they have to, you know, we want to report that. And we have to make sure we put our, our uh, uh, team in place uh, to contact Trace and uh, make sure that we mitigate this the best we can uh, so that we don't uh, we don't spread uh, the virus um, in a substantial way so we deal with it the same same way um, the ski areas know uh, that there's a lot riding on their shoulders uh, with this I mean they, the requirements we we negotiated with them uh, and to allow them to open were substantial probably the strictest in the nation and um, and we feel that they were the right things to do but but it's a heavy burden on uh, on them uh, to adhere to that. Anything? Anything? Thank you. Okay. Stewart, NBC Five. Morning. Uh, since you've been speaking with Senator Sanders and Leahy, uh, Sanders yesterday was making uh, a real point about the six hundred dollar direct payments uh, in the latest package which he thought would go to 90 percent of vermonters what effect will that have how much of a lifeline is that how do you want people to spend it yeah you know i think uh, it, it'll be tremendous in some respects if you look at it as a an injection of uh, dollars into the economy uh, because when you start to do the math i think he was uh, he told me it was he thought about 93 percent of the of vermonters would receive this this direct payment six hundred dollars uh, per person six hundred per child if it holds and uh, when you do the math i i believe uh, you, you would come up with about 350 million dollars injected into the economy um, so that's substantial um, i would uh, you know i'm not going to tell people how to spend uh, the money that they receive um, but at the same time you know i uh, like everyone else probably on this uh, uh, at this press event uh, has had to prioritize you know take care of some bills that they may have 
uh, that are there, um, being able to put it towards things that they really, really need. Uh, and if uh, and then maybe a little bit that they can spend on their families. So we'll see uh, what they do with it. But uh, but again, uh, injecting that amount of money into the economy over the next uh, month or two uh, will help in substantial ways uh, to get through the last quarter of, uh, of what we're seeing to get us to the to the finish line. Uh, the legislature's opted to essentially be entirely virtual um, for the you know first reopening we've ever seen that way. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, will you uh, do, do you know yet what your message is going to be at your at your inaugural, uh, which I guess will also be virtual? Yeah, it will be a virtual. We haven't uh, we haven't determined a time for that at this point. Um, it won't be nothing as traditional at this point. So. Uh, we won't have the, uh, it won't be in the afternoon. We're hoping uh, for maybe uh, an evening uh, address. And uh, we'll talk about the state of the state at this point. I think this is a pivotal time. It's an important time. And I think Vermonters uh, need to hear uh, what we talk about a lot at this, uh, these press conferences. Uh, but uh, uh, the good and the bad and the opportunities that, that exist, I think. Uh, so where we go from here, what's my vision? And and you'll hear uh, a lot of that as well. And it'll be pragmatic and will uh, hopefully uh, um, enlightening for some. And, uh, and, you know, because it's not all, it's not all bad news. Uh, we have a lot to look forward to, especially with the vaccine uh, being distributed. And uh, over the next three, four, five, six months, uh, I believe that we will start to work towards uh, normalcy. So we have to be prepared for that so that we can come out of this uh, stronger, uh, economically stronger, stronger uh, in uh, multiple ways uh, than any other state. And we have the opportunity to do that because we've, we've been so good uh, over the last nine months and we've, we've been healthy. We're one of the healthiest, safest states in the country. Yes, sir. Um, I, I just don't want to clarify, I got it from Dr. Levine, but so the guidance for Christmas is identical to Thanksgiving, that is essentially what your message is today. At, at this point in time, yeah, stuff. at this point in time, Stuart, uh, we have not still uh, have not received enough data. You know, we've seen that it seems to have plateaued. Uh, we were given a little bit of hope on a couple of days when it went one one day it was in the 60s, another day in the 70s, but then it went and elevated to 138 uh, down uh, yesterday to about I think it was 86 yesterday. So we just want to see what the trend is. Um, so we'll update again on Tuesday. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, we are advising uh, that uh, regardless, it won't change substantially. But we're, we're, regardless of what happens, we, we think the best thing to do uh, is to, to treat it as we did uh, during Thanksgiving, as other states uh, around us, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island, and so forth, have advocated. Uh, don't gather uh, if you if you know want and need. I mean, I and I understand the emotional need here, uh, but at the same time, uh, we have to we have to take care of ourselves, take care of our families, uh, and take care of others uh, surrounding us. So, just think about that before you act. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Dr. Levine, um, your statistics show there's been an estimated almost 4,000 COVID cases that are considered recovered in Vermont. I'm just wondering over the last nine months or so, how often does the health department check in with these past patients uh, and, and like what specific efforts has the health department taken to monitor or study or get reports? about these people to see about any short-term or long-term impacts COVID might have on, on them or their families, co-workers, whatever, uh, what the impact of the community is. Also, also, do you know uh, what your study show as to whether anybody that caught COVID-19 uh, more than once in Vermont? Great, so the second question, uh, we, I don't have any knowledge of anyone who got a second infection. But I'm glad you asked the first question, um, because that allows us to again talk about 
what happens to people after COVID. You know, I think the majority of uh, Americans think that unless you're in that highest risk group, you do very well with COVID. And very well to them means um, you didn't end up in the hospital, you stayed alive, you, uh, you know, didn't have such severe symptoms that it totally knocked you for a loop. But the reality is, and we don't know a firm number here, somewhere in the up to 10% range may have more long-term symptoms. So they never truly feel they recovered. And those symptoms can be similar to what we once called the chronic fatigue syndrome with a lot of fatigue, but they don't have to just be fatigue. They can be uh, discomforts and joints and chest wall. They can be shortness of breath. Um, uh, things that have some consequence for people. And um, the affectionate name long hauler syndrome has been given to them. Uh, and nobody understands that well. And when I say nobody, uh, it's, it's an evolving science, an evolving field to really try to figure that out. So at the uh, national level, um, they're talking about doing some studies, but I don't know that anyone has been particularly funded yet or is active. At the local level, I've been concerned about this uh, for many, many months. And we've, within, the, within the health department, we've actually um, started to make plans about how to perhaps use our medical volunteer corps. Um, hopefully, we'll have nothing else for them to do uh, and engage them in working with us so that we can actually do what you just suggested, which is calling for monitors who may show up in the recovered category but we really don't know long term what happens. Most of the contact we have with Vermonters, uh, to further answer your question, is at the one month point and within that one month period as opposed to beyond one month. And as you could see with the number of cases we're getting in these last few months and the amount of contact tracing that has to be done around those cases, that's keeping our workforce very, very busy. Uh, and to begin to start using them to start contacting people who may have gotten sick in April, May, June, July, what have you, um, isn't going to happen right at this point in our uh, time course. But we're very interested in that, and that's why we've outlined uh, the nidus of a, of a study that will occur uh, over time here so we can get some of that information. But we don't really have a lot to tell you. There are select physicians in the state. Um, one, in, one at UVM that I'm aware of in the pulmonary unit who actually um, have begun seeing a number of these patients. Uh, so they don't have a good idea of how extensive the problem is because they're only seeing a select group. But they're already seeing people with the symptoms that I just told you about uh, who feel they've never really recovered. Um, and I think we need to get a good handle on that, not only in Vermont but across the country. Okay, good. And my follow-up, uh, this uh, comes from a reader up in Caledonia County uh, who says the focus is on the vaccine, which is good, uh, but they're inquiring about treatment of people with COVID. Uh, the New York Times apparently reported last week that many, quote, important, unquote, people are getting successful treatment, not available to many often by lottery available at all. Do you know what this treatment is and what is being done to make it available to all? And is this treatment available in Vermont? And if so, who gets it and how is the decision made? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit of guesswork about what you're talking about, but I think my educated guess will be correct. Uh, we're talking mostly about monoclonal antibody therapy. You may recall the president got something from Regeneron, um, and there's a... Um, that's, what I was, that's what I was wondering, if that was what it was. Yeah, and so the federal government has been sending monoclonal antibody treatments, including that one, but another one as well, to the states. We've been getting about 20 doses a month 
The last time we got 40 doses. Um, they come to us and we have them distributed to uh, the, all the regions of the state uh, so they're available for use. I've talked about them at this press conference a little bit and uh, I have great hope for these treatments. I don't believe they have significant uh, side effects. Their goal is to take people who are moderately ill but outside of the hospital, able to be at home, and get treatment in time so that they don't end up in the hospital. So preventing hospitalization in moderately ill people. So it takes getting to know who those people are making sure they get themselves tested early enough so they know that they may be eligible uh, and not waiting too long till they get too sick. It's a complicated treatment only in the, and I put that in quotes, because it has to be given intravenously over about an hour or so. And it requires an infusion center to do it. And of course, most of our infusion centers are doing their best to keep COVID out of them and trying to give people other infusions like chemotherapy and things that will keep them alive from the conditions they already have. So they now have to devote a part of their infusion center to a COVID patient. So the other part that's been a little slow on the uptake is that there's only one study that really shows uh, a beneficial impact, which is not to say it doesn't have a beneficial impact. It's just that many of the guidance panels from the NIH and other uh, significant scientific communities haven't yet said this should be a standard of care and they're being very cautious about its use. So those are the issues. I've just put them all out on the table for you. Uh, but uh, there are doses in Vermont that are available for people to use right this very moment. Um, and if their clinicians feel comfortable with the treatment and feel that the patient is eligible, they can get that treatment uh, at a variety of our hospitals around the state. Okay. Thank you as always. Greg, the County Courier. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Levine, I might as well catch you while you're still at the lectern there. <laughs> Uh, we'll see, like, there have been reports of extra doses uh, in the Pfizer vaccine in, in some vials by maybe 20 or 40 percent, which uh, by the looks of it could be 1,000 or 2,000 patients in Vermont just, just this week. Uh, it, how does the state come up with, you know, that many people to get uh, vaccinated just, you know, very quickly if, if it's... Uh, I missed the very first sentence you said. Was it regarding shortages? The extra doses. Uh, the no, no. So the uh, Pfizer vaccine, we're hearing that okay. uh, they may be shipping you know, 20 to 40 percent more in a vial than what was expected. Yes, okay, I'm gotcha. I'm curious how yeah. the state comes up with you know, an extra one or 2,000 people to vaccinate when, when it's very well calculated on who, who would get it right off. Yeah, so let me just explain to people what you're talking about first. So each vial was meant to have about five doses in it once you put the saline and dilute out the, the material in the vial. It's turned out that uh, through experience, literally, hours of experience, days of experience, that people are learning around the country that you can actually get more than five doses out of that. Sometimes six, some feel you could even get seven. So that would obviously provide more vaccine from the allocated doses that you were given in the first place. Um, so everybody's going to take advantage of that. What we've heard is no one's gonna be penalized for that. And for us, it's really, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but the reality is just to get through the priority group 1A is going to take enough weeks that if this shortens it by a day or what have you, that's wonderful, but it's, uh, it's not going to be a game changer, if I could call it that. It's going to allow us to get through each group a little bit faster than we anticipated. Um, it won't really create an ethical dilemma for us about who's going to get some of this extra material because 
we're going to use the allocations we get for the priority groups in their order anyways. So if we can move a little faster to the next priority group, that would be a wonderful thing, and we'll just do that. Uh, but um, I wouldn't expect it to be a real boondoggle, if you will. I will say that with Moderna potentially begin, becoming uh, authorized, we'll have a lot more doses next week than if it wasn't authorized. But we've already kind of accounted for those doses and are thinking with priority group 1A anyways. Uh, so they've already been in our calculations. Appreciate it. Uh, my other question for you, Dr. Mead, is uh, I understand that on Monday the state will begin vaccinating those who either live in or work with uh, long-term living facilities. Uh, will the state prioritize facilities that are, are currently or very recently uh, impacted by uh, outbreaks? such as St. Albans Health and Rehab, or uh, will they just get mixed in like every other long-term facility would be? So there's a phase A and a phase B to your question. Phase A is the 37 skilled nursing facilities around the state. So that's the highest acuity facilities. That's where the people who have the most dependence on care uh, live. And that's where the worst of our outbreaks are. So they're already in the priority group uh, of long-term care facilities. Phase B is what you would call assisted living or residential care facilities that people live more independently at. Those are B because they're not as acute as the A. So uh, I think I can answer your question with the word yes, having given that explanation. Uh, not sure if I clarified quite the way I intended to. There are some facilities that are seeing current outbreaks. Are they being prioritized any more than the same type of facility that isn't seeing an outbreak? Yeah, they're, they're in the 37 uh, for the most part, and they are on a schedule with the pharmacy. So I can't tell you if they're on the first day or the second day. Uh, but they're in that group so that during the month of December, they're going to get their vaccine. Okay. Uh, appreciate it. I do have one non-COVID question. We can wait till the end if, if there's time for second. Okay. Thank you. Aaron Matanko, VT Digger. based on a report from ProPublica that came out, I think, this morning, um, where they found that many states are not planning on collecting uh, racial data about who gets the vaccine, which could be a potential concern because of how black people and other people of color have been disproportionately impacted by the virus and because of some reports that black people in particular are potentially more reluctant to get the vaccine because of longstanding, uh, you know, medical discrimination. Is the state of Vermont collecting racial data or other demographic data about who gets the vaccine? And do you plan to release that kind of data to the public or to me? Because I'd be very to see it. So thanks for highlighting um, that, that topic in general, because that's really of significant concern to us. And um, just to give background, the so-called BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color population, um, not only have suffered from uh, historical and uh, other injustices uh, over time, but in the current era, as we've highlighted here sometimes, they have a disproportionate share of both COVID cases and COVID hospitalizations when you compare that to the percent they make up in our total population in the state. So they're already uh, in a population of focus when it comes to uh, the vaccine itself. 
and making sure that all of our efforts regarding education about the vaccine, messaging about the vaccine, and engaging communities about the vaccine uh, highlight the fact that we have to pay attention to this population very specifically. Uh, most of what we do uh, in COVID data now includes race and ethnicity as a core ingredient so that we understand the pandemic very well. Traditionally, in vaccination, if you look at vaccination as an entire field, from measles to flu to what have you, uh, that's not always been one of the data points that clinicians have been asked to uh, collect, or if they've been asked to collect, don't always consistently collect. So we don't have as good data on that um, from a historic standpoint. Our goal is to try to change that for this uh, particular vaccine. And I can't tell you we have it in place just yet, but that's what we're working towards. Uh, so to try, try to provide not only you, but ourselves and others with that kind of data will be really, really important. Uh, our biggest focus right now is on engaging communities um, so that we can make sure that the uptake of the vaccine is as high as we would want it across all populations, across all ethnicity and racial groups. Uh, because that's not been true in the past, even if we look at things like flu vaccine, um, there's been a historical in, uh, reluctance to uh, have the same uptake uh, of vaccine. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I know that in other states, when I've looked at flu uh, vaccine data, um, there's a trend of like lower income uh, school districts having uh, lower vaccination rates. Is that the kind of thing that Vermont is seeing as well? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um. Uh, are, is there are there any is there any evidence of disparities that you know of in newer vaccine data that state has flexed in the past? Right. Yes. Yes. So the, with flu data specifically, we have some data that does indicate um, that you know vaccination rate by race does vary, with whites being the highest rate of uptake. But as you know, even with flu vaccine, that's not always as high as we'd want it to be, even in the uh, racial data where people are having it uptake the most. So that's of concern. Um, I think what we have to really emphasize on this go around is the need to make sure that when a person is vaccinated, the appropriate data is consistently collected from person to person. Um, and that will have to be a big focus of what we do if we're going to be able to understand if there are problems or if there are no problems uh, in the deployment of this vaccine for the broad population. Okay, thank you very much. Eric, the time circus. Yes, last night I got a call from a very town resident. He's older, over age 85. He lives with his wife, they're independent. Uh, he says he understands the need to prioritize healthcare workers and those with long term care facilities. Um, but he especially wants to know when he's going to be able to have access to the virus. He said, uh, to the vaccine, sorry. Uh, he said he spoke to his doctor and he was told that there is no timeline right now for when he would get the vaccine. Yeah, and I guess the answer would be uh, we're working on a plan, and I would anticipate uh, that uh, the Barrytown resident would be on the front end of that list uh, based on the age uh, and the uh, and the vulnerability of that uh, that person. So we're uh, we're actively, in fact, we we talked about this uh, at great length uh, last night and uh, developing a plan. Uh, we've got a ways to go before we get there uh, during the. Uh, healthcare workers, as well as uh, those in long-term care facilities and staff members, and so forth. So it's going to take us a while to get through that, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll be able to release the plan that we've been working on for the other groups and and what uh, who and what uh, what groups come first. Does the state have any estimates on those who are over 65, the, the high-risk people, that to know how long it might take to vaccinate that group? 
I'll refer to Dr. Levine at this point, but uh, I mean, I'm sure we have the data. It's just that whether he has it at his fingertips at this point in time. Yeah, I think, I think we're talking about 20% of our population, which, you know, because we're in the top four states for the percent uh, over age 65, and I think it's about 20%. Uh, I can confirm the precise number to the decimal point uh, at a later time. Uh, I would want to say, though, that uh, regarding your uh, reader, uh, the, the bottom line is we can make all the plans we want, but they are contingent on how many doses of vaccine are coming into the state. And beyond the month of December, we actually don't have any, you know, clear guidelines on that. It obviously depends on will we have two vaccines available, which we are optimistic about. Will there be other vaccines that become available after the new year based on uh, the, the pace of the studies that they're involved with? And what is the production capacity of all of the companies that uh, are making these vaccines that are getting approved. So uh, a bunch of it hinges on just how fast we can get the vaccine into the state. Uh, and then we can deploy it uh, with the mechanisms that we're setting up that the governor referred to. And finally, just make a plea to your 85-year-old uh, uh, to stay safe. Uh, hang on until that point in time. Um, and avoid the kind of multi-household gatherings and crowded areas that I'm sure they've been doing already to get to the good point they're in in their life right now uh, because it's just a matter of a little time. And we would hope by late January, February, we'd be talking about that population maybe a little sooner in January if more vaccine comes in than we would have thought. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, so speaking of uh, the vaccine, just a quick question. Has Vermont gotten all of the vaccine doses that we expected to get? Because I know our neighbors in New Hampshire felt like they didn't. Yeah, we've been hearing uh, rumblings over the last uh, couple of days. Uh, I've had uh, a couple of texts mm -hmm. from our neighbors, uh, gov other governors, uh, saying that they have been uh, their their allotment has been reduced, and so I reached out to. Our, our agency of human services as well as uh, the health department to see if that was the case uh, up until this morning uh, that was not the case uh, that we were still scheduled to receive our allotment but uh, literally five minutes before we came into this press conference i believe that we received the news uh, that our allotment would be reduced as well uh, and i'll let dr levine talk about that a little bit So I've been engaged with uh, all of my colleagues in the region who are reporting a 25 to 35 percent decrease in their allocation for next week. Um, and two of my colleagues, uh, one in the Midwest, one in Montana, who were talking about 20 to 25 percent range. Uh, these are states that obviously all are getting more doses than we are because we're the second least populated state in the country, so we're already at a pretty low level. Um, as we were walking in, I learned that as many as 975 doses out of the expected 5,850 doses uh, would not be coming in when we expected. That doesn't mean we won't be getting all of the doses, it just means it won't be coming when we expected. The, if I do with some quick math, standing here, this is real pressure, um, that's about a sixth of the uh, allocation, so uh, 16, 17, less than 20 percent anyways, uh, but still it means something. What everyone around the country is upset about, in addition to just the number, is there's been no communication. So there's no understanding of what this really means. Um, I've heard, uh, but not had it confirmed, that the federal government has been saying that it just means you won't get it on the day you expected it, but it'll be more spread out over the course of the week. Um, that would be fine, to be honest, 
um, as long as we had that reassurance. The Pfizer company itself has been uh, pretty adamantly denying it is on their end that the problem is, and there's been good production still, uh, and that that wouldn't be why we weren't seeing it. So I can only tell you what I know now, and that pretty much summarizes it. Is this kind of thing expected in, the, in a vaccine rollout like this to have something like this happen where there was a either a miscommunication or uh, some sort of snafu with the allotments and shipments? Well, you know, I think the last vaccine rollout was H1N1, and uh, I wasn't presiding over that in Vermont, but I do know that we saw very, very small numbers of doses over a very long period of time. So I'm not sure this kind of situation actually occurred that we just described here, but certainly the slow pace of vaccine coming into the state is something that was an expectation for this time around based on that time around. Uh, but I don't know if the exact same scenario that I just described happened. Last question on the vaccine. Um, did Vermont get a proportional population-wise proportional amount to what other states got? Because one of our other viewers pointed out that it appeared New Hampshire was getting more of the vaccine proportional to their population than Vermont was. Is that is that the case? Yeah, I haven't done all the calculations. All I did do is look at the map, and Wyoming was the only state that got less than 5,000 doses, which is less than us, and they are the least populated state in the country. Um, so all I know is we were at least in the right range for being the second populated state in the country. Um, but I don't know, I didn't calculate everybody's uh, population and their proportions, so I don't know. I'm, I, I guess we're relying on the government to have done this in an honorable fashion and taken the appropriate percent of the population and applied it fairly across 50 states. And just to confirm that for our viewers, because I don't want to get this question, the vaccine distribution was not based on current case count. It was based on population only. Right. It has nothing to do with uh, states that are having more of a surge or less of a surge. Got it. Thank you. Just to add to that, uh, as a reminder uh, to viewers who aren't aware, uh, New Hampshire has twice the population uh, that Vermont does. So uh, they could have received, if they received twice the amount that we were anticipating receiving. Uh, that would have been around, you know, 10, uh, 10 11,000. So I'm not sure what they received, but I didn't hear that they received uh, a whole lot more. The other uh, complicating factor in all of this, and, and we'll know more on Tuesday, we'll be able to report as to why maybe we received the reduction in other states did as well. But as you remember, uh, the, the news of the last few days has been that uh, they're actually getting more out of the vial. Uh, so they're getting uh, an extra dose or two out of every vial. And if you do the math, um, that is uh, percentage-wise about that same reduction. So in one sense, we may not be talking about a whole lot different in terms of doses uh, than we are anticipating. So we'll see. We'll be able to clear that up, hopefully, by Monday. Well, I'll, uh, I'll stay tuned to the headlines because I'm off next week. So have a, have a good holiday week, <laughs> All right. everyone. You too. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, hello. I, I guess this is for Dr. Levine as well. Uh, I'm curious, uh, assuming, you know, a, a perfect world where all the vaccine that um, might be needed was available, how many people could be vaccinated in Vermont um, over uh, a week, say? I mean... <laughs> Play the what if game. <laughs> I have, <laughs> well, I did the quick math for the early calculation. I'm not sure I could do it for this calculation. Uh, if, if every primary care practice had the vaccine um, and every pharmacy had the vaccine, it would be a real overburdening for all of them. Uh, we would need something more than that in terms of more of a mass vaccination effort. Um, and that would take time to set up, but indeed, that's the kind of planning one does when when you know that's happening. But really hard for me to uh, to even get more specific right now with uh, how how many we could do, knowing as a former 
general internal medicine doctor and having vaccines for my patients, you can only see so many patients a day. And even if you set up a vaccine clinic each evening, you can only get so much throughput if you want to do that safely and correctly. Um, so we get a chunk of Vermonters, but I'm not sure how many. So the fact that we aren't getting um, the vaccine doesn't mean that we aren't getting a lot more of the vaccine right now it is actually not a problem um, as it might seem uh, to someone without the medical education like me. No, don't, don't come across like that because the reality is we could see a lot more vaccine now and deploy it all. All we're relying on right now is the hospitals to deliver it to the healthcare worker force and the pharmacy partnership to deliver it to the long-term care facilities. But that doesn't involve anybody in Vermont who wants a vaccine. That's a very select group. So if we start talking about all the people over 65, all the people who see their doctors regularly for chronic conditions, um, there's plenty of uh, opportunity to give them vaccine starting today if we had the vaccine for that purpose. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't come to the conclusion that it's a blessing to not have so much right now, because we could easily dispense a lot more vaccine if we got it all today or this weekend. And just one more thing, who is paying for the vaccine right now? Is this um, federal money at this point? And if so, um, are there limits that you know of that may result in problems down the line. So, so I think what you're saying though is, is the vaccine free to people? And the answer to that is yes. The federal government is footing that bill. Um, there are select administration fees that a practice might uh, garner from the interaction with the patient and all of that but there are ways for that to be paid for, for those who have insurance. And if those don't have insurance, we have our district health offices and other mechanisms in Vermont to deliver the vaccine to them for free. So nobody should be paying out of pocket for this vaccine. And um, the amount of money that the federal government is providing to make this possible, um, that, that Funding is going to last long enough that everyone who needs to be and should be vaccinated will be able to get vaccinated under this program. I can answer part of that. I'm going to let the governor answer that part. Yeah, Joe, um, in my conversations with the uh, Senator Leahy and Senator Sanders, uh, there is money attached to the bills. Uh, that hopefully will pass in the next day or so. So, and have to do with the the vaccines and vaccinations. So that that is being accounted for, and uh, and as part of one of the two bills. But it's all going to be one bill uh, once it passes, uh, from what I was told by both of them. Thank you very much. And and I I also want to uh, to comment further uh, with as Dr. Levine had alluded to, with the Moderna uh, vaccine coming on. Uh, on uh, hopefully uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, there may be other platforms as well, other manufacturers that may get approval. And we're having some of those conversations. We don't want to get caught uh, without being able to distribute it just as quick as we possibly can. And some of it's due to my, uh, maybe my uh, contractor background, production is everything, uh, trying to, to make sure that we can get things done as efficiently as possible. So we're. We're having some of those what if conversations and uh, we want to be ready uh, if that uh, if that happens. It doesn't appear that it's going to happen any to in the in the near future. Uh, but if it does, uh, we will have a plan available so that we can uh, we can distribute and vaccinate on a on a, a large, uh, maybe a larger scale if necessary. Thank you. Again. Well, uh, just a quick time check here. It's 1230 and we still have 14 reporters in the queue for Greg's extra question. Uh, Chris, so if we could just try to keep it to two to three instead of three to four. Uh, Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon. 
Um, I guess this message might be for Dr. Levine. Do you know how many um, vaccines are available up here in the Northeast Kingdom, particularly in Orleans County? And is there anything, any reason why somebody wouldn't, shouldn't get both vaccines for, or multiple vaccines from different vendors when and if they become available? So I don't have a precise number to give you. Uh, I don't have that spreadsheet with me, but um, we've given vaccine to all of the uh, hospitals in the regions in a proportionate manner uh, to the size of the healthcare workforce that they need to vaccinate. And the second part is um, there is that, this is why it's so important to have a vaccine tracking system so that once, once you get your first dose, we know you got the first dose, the date you got it, and the vaccine you got, so that when it's time for the second dose, you know if you need to come back in three weeks or four weeks to get which vaccine. And so even if you got it at a different location, uh, that information would track with you. I think ideally okay, you'd probably... Mix and match. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you can't mix and match. So if you got Pfizer uh, day one, you need to get Pfizer day 21 and not Moderna, not Moderna day 28. Um, it's strongly discouraged to doing that. Um, th this is a little bit of a brave new world thing where we're, um, you know, using the data we have and the science we have. And the science we have takes one vaccine and gets the person the second dose, and we know what outcomes to expect. We would have no idea what to expect if you mixed and matched them, and um, it, it's not being advised. You know, and they have slightly different side effect profiles as well. Um, they have slightly different age ranges, and um, it, it wouldn't be a good idea. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Hope you have a nice holiday weekend. Liz, Burlington Free Press. Hi there, thanks for taking my questions. Um, my first question is for um, the governor or Dr. Levine or both. Um, and it's kind of along the same line of questioning as Erin. Um, so the Social Equity Caucus recently sent you both um, a letter urging that members of the BIPOC community be in a group one C priority group um, for the vaccine and I just, I, I wanted to know what your response to this is, or is this um, part of the plan that's being um, formulated at this point? Yeah, a little bit of both. Uh, Pre-letter, uh, uh, we had already uh, been working on this initiative and, and how to make sure that we're uh, providing for that, uh, that population. So we were uh, ahead, of, uh, ahead of the letter. And, uh, and in terms of you know, how it's done, uh, we are having those conversations now to make sure that we get to them just as quick as possible. If you want to? Great. And the only thing I'd add to that is, this is not Vermont's problem. This is a national problem as well. Uh, we'll own what we need to own by by all means, but there is going to be the advisory committee on immunization practices. There's going to be our own Vermont advisory panel. Uh, so we don't want to put the cart before the horse either because we're going to be getting um, some input from people who actually are going to be thinking about this actual uh, scenario that you've painted here. So it's really important that we um, focus on the input we get as well as uh, what we were already thinking. Okay. And my second question, I think probably um, for Dr. Levine, um, a reader asked about if basically the time when vaccines become more available to the general public, um, if people will be able to pick and choose which vaccine they get, um, you know, for the first dose, um, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, or any other one that is um, approved. Uh, do you have any, I guess, uh, guidance at, at this point on that? Yeah, I don't have a lot of guidance on that. That's that's almost like a a best case scenario, you know, that's like a marketplace where uh, to some extent supply and demand may dictate, but to other extents it could be personal preference um, or personal review of the data about each vaccine. 
Uh, so I, I certainly would think we wouldn't be authoritarian in that. We would let, let, let people have some choice if we were blessed with abundant vaccine from several different companies, maybe even several different types of vaccine, an mRNA vaccine, one based on protein, et cetera. Uh, so wouldn't want to close the door on those thoughts. Um, right now, you know, those thoughts aren't close to our mind because we're lucky to have what we have and we want to make sure we use it because we know it has good effectiveness. Uh, but will, uh, you know, that point in time where that person in the general population is going to be eligible is obviously getting into the spring. So we'll have plenty of time to sort that out uh, and know what's available in terms of numbers and types of vaccine. Thank you very much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, I had a couple of questions. Kind of question, probably for Secretary Curley. Yeah. And uh, for Lindsay Curley, I was wondering if, if, if there is more stimulus, is it going to be targeted toward hospitality? That's been sort of where the grants have been going and the hardest hit industry. And for uh, Victoria Young, I was wondering if we should make too much out of the revenue numbers, which are getting very good. Are you concerned that the door, the economic door, could suddenly slam shut if there wasn't a stimulus package? Yes, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, you know, we honestly don't know what will be available uh, coming out of kind of coming out of Congress. Uh, you know, if if there in the event there was was federal relief that would be um, we would be able to generate uh, grants with the way we did before. We have no plans for exactly how we would focus that. Um, so again, it's just too soon to tell. We, with the hospitality industry, that was something that with the legislature uh, looking at the need, we had the benefit of seeing what the applications were showing and the real need across our state. And it was, there was a, a decision to put 75 million to the food and accommodation sector. Um, while that targeted that sector, what it also did was it raised the percentage of um, grant need that we would be able to uh, hit in the other sectors. So again, too soon to tell, and I think, I don't know if the governor wants to add to any of this, but before Secretary Young, do you have anything to add? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, Tim, um, from what we're understanding at this point in time, and uh, we don't have all the details, but it doesn't appear that it's going to be done in the same manner as before. Uh, before we received a, a huge check uh, to the uh, to the state, uh, and then we uh, we determined how we were going to distribute that. It it, it appears it's going to be more targeted. Uh, I would expect, uh, as I understand, that it could be uh, a major portion of the economic relief could be in PPP. So we'll we'll see uh, when it's passed, but uh, um, but I don't think it's going to be done the same manner as uh, previous. Uh, and and there could be another stimulus uh, coming on the heels of this as well. Uh, that's uh, the other thing that uh, Senator Sanders in particular had talked about, and Senator Leahy. So initially, not as much discretionary. Yeah, not by the state. More um, we would administer it, obviously. Uh, but it would be directed uh, in different ways. Okay, great. I, was there a question for uh, Secretary Young? I, I, on, so. the on the revenue. Yeah, the, the revenue number just came in, and, and she sounded in the press release that she was hitching her bets a little bit on, on how they, it, it looks very, very good right now, but uh, you know, without another federal stimulus package. I'm sure Secretary Young will comment on this, but I just want to remind everyone we we already you know we knew that we were going to be challenged this year from a budgetary standpoint, and the revenues coming in were already downgraded before we started by 300 million dollars. So when we when we talk about uh, uh, have exceeding uh, our revenues on a monthly basis or quarterly basis. Uh, that's after we started uh, with with a three hundred million dollar downgrade. So just so that we're all aware, uh, it's good news, uh, but uh, but but challenge right from the from the start. Uh, Secretary Young. 
Thank you, Governor. You're absolutely right. I think that's the first point is it looks rosy, but so I recall we're starting um, at a place nearly 300 million below where we thought we would be, you know, with our January forecast. So we're not doing as bad as we had expected, I guess is so, uh, another way to say that. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the sales and use uh, revenues are looking good and, and, you know, a lot of this we are attending to the stimulus and the economic recovery um, grants that have gone out and without further you know, federal assistance in, in I think all quarters, um, our expectation would be the next six months will not be as positive as the first six months of the fiscal year. All right, great, thank you very much. Peter, VPR. Governor, I know you said the uh, relief package is still in flux, but based on your conversation with members of the delegation, does that package as currently envisioned extend unemployment benefits for the 20,000 or so Vermonters who are expected to time out next week? Yes, yeah, it does. Um, the, the part that's missing, uh, the details that I talked about before were that we we don't know exactly, and uh, and they weren't uh, they weren't exactly sure where it was going to end up, whether it's going to be retroactive, uh, whether it's going to start at a certain time, um, but um, and and as well when you know when the extra uh, payment would start and who would qualify. So uh, good news uh, all the way around. If it passes, uh, there will be unemployment benefits for those who are about ready to lose them. It'll be an extension of some of the program. So um, that's all I know at this point, but, uh, but uh, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic and, uh, and they, they felt as though uh, something was going to pass uh, because we aren't the only uh, state facing uh, this issue. Thank you. Uh, and Secretary French, you talked about these recovery plans. You're asking districts to uh, begin drafting to, to become effective in February, it sounded like. Can you talk about the specific kinds of programs and services that you think students are going to need? Yeah, and thanks for the question. I think it's, it's early in that. I'm certainly, uh, we've had very uh, frequent and close communications with uh, our partners in the Department of Mental Health, uh, but we just know that there's gonna be a need for an integrated response that sort of transcends beyond the boundaries of, of uh, the education system. So we just wanna prepare the system uh, for that sort of integrated response. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello. I had a reader ask me this week um, whether people who have tested positive with a PCR test for COVID and recovered are still required to quarantine. Can you confirm that they are still required to quarantine? You mean if they travel, Lisa, or if they have a gathering? Um, it's somebody, yeah, sorry, it's someone coming into the state. So, they tested positive just because they wanted to be tested before they came to Vermont? Is that? No, I believe this is a case of a second homeowner, homeowner who was serving to a local business person that was tested to a local business person that they didn't need to quarantine because they had had COVID in the spring, last spring. Ah, okay. Um, now I get the scenario. I would, uh, this is a little bit of uncharted territory, but if it's been over three months since they actually were infected, we don't know the duration of someone's immunity, and we don't know that they can't uh, transmit virus to someone else that's in their nose. Uh, just like with the vaccine, we're not yet sure if people Will, will not be able to transmit. So I would want them to abide by all of our current uh, safety um, guidances regarding quarantine coming from out of state. So I would say they, the answer is they need to do that. Great, thank you very much. Dana, Local 22. Dana? Hello. Um, my question is, are you worried about people getting a false sense of security when they get the vaccine, like 
will stop wearing masks or they'll think that they don't have to wash their hands anymore? Is that a concern? Yeah, it is uh, for me, and I'm sure that Dr. Levine will have more to say about this, but uh, especially uh, after the first vaccination, it's going to take it, take a while to build up that immunity, and you need the second uh, shot this, uh, as a booster uh, to make it highly uh, get to the 95 percent effective. So uh, from the time you have your first shot to the time you're uh, truly in a, in a safe uh, uh, state, so to speak, um, that's two months. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very concerned that uh, that people won't understand that you still need to wear a mask. Even if you if you just have your shot, you're going to need to wear your mask. You need to stay physically separated. You need to wash your hands. Uh, you need to stay away from others when sick. I mean, it's all the same things, uh, particularly in the first two months. Dr. Levine. Thank you. Sorry. Right. Thank Oh, that was, my, that was my only question. Okay, thank you. Avery, WCAX. Governor Scott, there's a UVM women's basketball and UVM women's hockey game scheduled for this weekend. Um, but what is the state's rationale for allowing these games to go on, but high school sports is still not allowed to play? Yeah, we, I mean, we had to separate uh, the colleges and universities, or we felt that it was best to separate that and let them uh, deal with that on a much more uh, regional and and, uh, and uh, countrywide basis, but I, I'm going to let uh, Secretary Curley answer this. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the colleges and universities have worked closely with the Health Department and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development and Public Safety to create a plan that would work for them to continue competing. They have the um, ability to, and, and when they have the ability to test far more frequently than we do with say club or, or high school or middle school sports. Um, it enabled us to get, give them a little broader uh, ability to compete, but they have strict plans that they, number one, they're following NCAA guidance, but they also produced another plan, submitted another plan to our agency that was reviewed by the Department of Health and our agency to ensure that it meets the spirit of our um, our intentions, our hopes in terms of keeping not only the players healthy and safe, but the public, the general public. So that um, the uh, the college guidance is on the website at ACCD, and um, as well as the athletic uh, guidance is on there. And I don't know if Dr. Levine wants to add anything on that, but yeah. So that it's was the yeah, it's extensive testing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, just a quick follow-up. We saw with the hockey outbreak, you all mentioned that really it was kind of the social aspect of the, sport, not the actual sport themselves that caused the spread. What is being done to reduce that effect with college athletics? Yeah, so they um, their students all signed an additional um, uh, uh, agreement that, that said that outside of uh, practices and games, that they would really limit their activity and make sure that they followed the state's um, executive order, which uh, prohibits gatherings right now of multi-households. So when they're not practicing as a team and whatnot, they're not supposed to be gathering socially if they're in different households. So they uh, they had another, like I said, a, another element of agreement and uh, really saying that they would step up and do the right thing and do everything they could to value this opportunity to compete at this time and um, we we have met with the athletic directors uh, probably twice monthly and um, they reach out regularly and get clarification as needed so thank you andrew caledonian record uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this uh, perhaps for either Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith. I'm uh, just curious how productive uh, your sessions were this week with the officials from Essex and Orleans County. And uh, did you learn anything from them or have any action steps been developed as a result? Maybe Secretary Smith, can you, uh, can you comment first? Sure, just to give uh, the listeners a uh, some background. We met with the local and state uh, officials from both uh, Essex 
first to Essex County and then, or Leans County. And I, what I learned is that local officials and um, state elected officials as well really want to do the right thing up there. They really want to make sure that people are adhering to uh, the, the social, uh, excuse me, the distancing, uh, the six foot distancing, the mask wearing, uh, washing hands, staying home if you're sick. Uh, they really want to do the right, they want to get the right message out there as well. So that, that was the message that I heard from local officials. They also want to make sure that, you know, anything that we can give them in terms of data, in terms of outbreaks up there, uh, please keep them informed. And we had agreed to sort of uh, make sure that we keep them informed about various things that are that are happening in their the, their area. Dr. Levine, do you have anything to add to that? I think that pretty well summarized it. We also learned about uh, the new testing sites that we've set up and how useful they have been, but also, again, how challenging a geographic area we're dealing with, uh, with the unique uh, length of the uh, counties. Uh, specifically Essex, um, and the interactions with our neighboring states and how that impacts life in, in those areas. So I'd say to summarize, it was a great experience for us to learn something and for the officials to learn from us. Yeah, that's a, that's a question you deserve an answer to. Um, to our knowledge, as of this moment, and again, we just got this news, that's going to come out of the allocation to the hospitals, and it doesn't impact the long-term care. But again, when I say it's coming out of that allocation, everyone believes the promise is that we'll still get the full allocation, just not when we expected it. And that's a level of detail I just don't have the answers to fill in the blanks about yet because we virtually just learned about it and there hasn't been wonderful communication coming down to the states. Okay, thanks. And, um, and as, as far as sort of um, the state's ability to um, make adjustments, how much leeway do you have to reallocate between those sort of those streams if needed? If, sort of there's a um, shortage in a week shipment um, to long-term care or for the sort of health care worker. Yeah, so the, the long-term care is a more challenging one to, to deal with, so we're, we're happy that that's being left alone. Uh, the hospital one's a little easier, uh, but I have to remind people with Pfizer, you have to get a dose of 975 uh, doses. Uh, so. Uh, that already limits where it can go, and that can be a big hit for one part of a state versus another uh, based on the quantity. So though we can make it up, um, it still is an issue you know, on that first day when we might have expected more of it than we're getting. But it shouldn't impact the long-term care plans at all. Okay. Um my understanding is that that long-term care um, batch was two, two of those 975 dose units. Um, and I, I know there are three pharmacies uh, in, in the program. How does the state do anything to sort of uh, put those doses up or do those come straight from the federal government? Yeah, those, are, those are coming direct from the federal government to the pharmacies themselves who have the uh, storage capacity to do that with the appropriate temperature freezer and all of that. So those get 
split up in some way? Or, or, yeah, um, yeah. I don't. I don't have every detail on. on yeah, yeah I, I, they are going to the three pharmacies, but I. I don't have every detail on uh, actually how that plays out. I know that we gave uh, one of the pharmacies a little extra on the first go around so that we could equalize them. So I think it's it's being done equitably. My questions are best uh, directed to the governor. Um, and first of all, I was, you know, when you address sports at the top of the briefing, it appeared to me, at least reading between the, the lines a little, that you are equating sports activities with multi household gatherings at this point. Is this a fair read on your stance? Yeah, I'm not sure. Right so now, is this why kids in in school together can't yet practice together as a team? Yeah, no, it's just a question of the timing and what we're seeing with the data and so forth. Um, this is one of my highest uh, priorities uh, outside of making sure the vaccinations get to long-term care facilities is getting kids back acclimated to a normal life. And I think uh, recreational sports is important uh, to kids, their emotional well-being, as well as to adults. So uh, we're working our way towards that. I just, uh, we don't want to pay the price for making the wrong move now, as I said on Tuesday. Uh, and, and, uh, and and prolong uh, what will the price we'll have to pay in January and February if we do something uh, that mm -hmm. is done too quickly. So we don't want to make the same mistakes uh, other states have made in the past, and we're just being careful. So we're just going to continue to monitor this. We might have an update on Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, but at this point in time, I just we haven't made a decision as to what we do. But but it is a very very high priority from from my standpoint. Understood. And when you mentioned that case counts, you know, these, these metrics need to dip from current levels for those restrictions on sports and gathering to change. Uh, what levels do you have in mind? Is it half as much as recently, less than that? Yeah. I'm getting the sense from folks that, like, they might appreciate a sense of how far away they are. And if they're monitoring those numbers, you know, to be able to be prepared for the moment when that might turn in their favor. Well, again, as you as you can uh, remember, uh, back in the early uh, during the summer and during uh, uh, during the fall, uh, we had numbers in the single digits uh, almost on a daily basis, and then uh, we started uh, around the Halloween uh, time. Uh, we uh, uh, mid uh, mid fall, let's say, uh, they started ramping up significantly. Uh, and we took a number of different actions to uh, counter that, but uh, they were up in the you know mid 100s, uh, up to over 200 at one point in time, and we uh, we were encouraged actually uh, to see them level back out uh, to around uh, you know 100 to 150, uh, and then start to drop. Uh, and as I said in my opening remarks, I was encouraged to see we we're down to 60 one day, in the 70s another day. And then all of a sudden, it shot back up to 138, I believe, uh, in uh, the following day. So uh, yesterday, uh, again, we saw that uh, they came down to around 86. Uh, and again, that's moving in the right direction. And one day, uh, as I steal from Dr. Levine, um, one day doesn't make a trend. Uh, one way or the other. And so we're watching. Uh, we don't know what happened on that one day when we went back up to 138. Uh, but we want to make sure that we don't follow this up uh, like today with 86. Um, if tomorrow was uh, 180, uh, then we'd have a problem. But if it uh, continues to, to level out and decline a bit, uh, then we might be able to open things up. And I think we can, on a, uh, as long as we're safe and smart about this, uh, especially with school sports. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope that we continue to, to at least stay where we are uh, today and uh, under 100. And if we can do that consistently, I believe that we can open the uh, recreation uh, sports uh, for uh, those in, uh, in our education system. Thank you. Ann Wallace-Allen, BC Digger.
Hi there. Um, this question is not unlike the sports question, except it's about lifting quarantine, which is something that a lot of the lodging businesses have been wondering about now that we have seen the advent of, that, of a vaccine. They're wondering um, if this is going to enable the governor to um, have any better idea when the state might lift its travel and quarantine restrictions for people from out of state. Yeah, it really, it really is about the data, and you know when we start doing the modeling and, and starting reverting back to our travel policy, uh, the way we uh, were doing it I thought was effective, and that's the way we'll work our way back out of it. Uh, so once we start to see the numbers decline uh, throughout the region, uh, then we'll start uh, start uh, doing the the travel map again and opening up counties as we did uh, previously. I know that Dr. Levine has said that well, it could take two, three, even five months for the for the vaccine to have an impact in terms of infection rate. Um, do you think that maybe lifting the travel restrictions will follow that same kind of timeline? Well, I would I would say you know we were we were we enjoyed a period of time uh, when we were able to treat, travel freely uh, throughout the Northeast, and that was long before uh, the vaccines came into play. And so you know this. There's an opportunity for both of them to work uh, in in our favor. So the vaccines come into place. We've put into into place uh, mitigation uh, strategies in all of the states around in the Northeast, throughout the country, but particularly in the Northeast. Um, so we're hoping that we'll see decline in the the positive uh, uh, cases, and when we do that, we'll be able, in in conjunction with the vaccines. I I, I don't. I'm hopeful uh, that it won't take as long as, uh, as uh, you have described. I believe uh, that uh, with both of those things taking place simultaneous uh, to each to one another, that we will be able to get to a, a point where we're able to open up um, the travel map, map um, sooner rather than later, hopefully in the next uh, month or two. But it's hard to say. It all depends on the data. Thank you very much. Steve, NEKTV? Steve? Hello, can you hear me? We can. Oh, great. Um, thank you. Uh, one for the governor and one for the doctor, if I may. Um, governor, you mentioned uh, uh, gathering data uh, about the BIPOC community. And I had a question specifically about the indigenous uh, data. Um, what would the large number of, uh, of French Canadian population that we have, and the fact that the early French Canadian, uh, early French settlers didn't bring their own, uh, you know, women along with them? Uh, uh, how would you how would you gauge uh, the indi uh, the indigenous population? I mean, uh, with a DNA test, um, uh, would you need 25% Abenaki DNA, 10% Abenaki DNA? Uh, how how would that work exactly? Yeah, no, I mean we're not going to get that uh, granular. Uh, in a lot of respects, uh, we hope this is, it would take longer to gather the information than it will be to vaccinate everyone. So our, our whole point here is that we want people who, uh, who, who identify uh, as from those communities. Um, we want to be able to get them the relief they want as soon as possible. So um, we're not going to take any DNA tests uh, to, to determine that. Uh, we're going to rely on them being um, um, truthful and open about who they are and what they're. Uh... Well, it isn't what you identify as. I mean, even sure. though That's... I'm like half, half old Yankee, if I identify as, uh, as indigenous, sure. does that make me yeah. indigenous? Sure. For, the, for in this in this instance, what we're trying to do is just. Uh, trying to make sure that we uh, were there to help and vaccine uh, is uh, available uh, to th those populations just as soon as possible. So if that's what you identify as, uh, that's fine from my perspective. Steve, did you say you had a question for Dr. Levine? Uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Levine. 
Um, I was reading the the, uh, the Vax trials by Moderna. I didn't get to the Pfizer one. Um, and their approved protocols, uh, they allowed asymptomatic results to be considered uh, the same as non-infectious, uh, to be considered COVID sick for the Vax efficacy results. Uh, they need both a symptom and a positive PCR test were needed. So if Moderna and the FDA don't consider asymptomatic people infectious or dangerous, then why keep the lockdowns and isolations that are uh, killing, uh, killing our small businesses? And you can see part of this on Moderna's clinical study, uh, the protocols on page 96 at modernatx.com. Yeah, so let me answer your question um, pretty directly. The, the outcomes of these studies are to reduce sickness. So one arm gets the vaccine, the other arm of the study gets a dummy injection that's not vaccine. And at a point in time when they develop symptoms, um, and are PCR positive, they've achieved the outcome. And both studies showed that dramatically less people who got the vaccine developed symptoms and were PCR positive than the other arm. Um, it's not really their commentary on asymptomatic people or their, their, their goal regarding asymptomatic people. It's really trying to prevent people from getting sick from this virus and having any of the other kinds of worse outcomes they might get because they got sick with the virus. From a public health standpoint, <clears throat> we want to reduce the number of people who are walking around without symptoms but still capable of transmitting the virus by coughing in your presence or sneezing or even singing or talking in your presence or breathing in your presence. But these vaccine trials really aren't set up to figure out if we're able to do that with the vaccine as well. That's the next question that's being asked is, will people who got the vaccine be less capable of transmitting the virus if it happens to get into their nose from breathing it in? Uh, or will they still be able to transmit it even though it won't make them sick? <clears throat> so we need to get at that information. But it's really nothing philosophical about how the studies were set up or, or what the companies are trying to achieve or not achieve. It's really very pragmatic. Have less people become ill and suffer from this virus. And um, we'll see how that pans out in terms of the transmission ability. But secondarily to oh. that, there's been uh, articles in the New York Times uh, and the Lancet the American Institute for Economic Research, et cetera. And they suggested that six months worth of data showed that the lockdowns um, don't work. And the recent case outbreak, both in the US and Europe, uh, and, and were in places with the strictest mask uh, policies and, and lockdown policies. And even uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon had a Facebook survey of over 3 million people that uh, confirmed this also. Um, so it, doesn't the data and the science show that, uh, that the virus is going to do what the virus is going to do regardless of uh, these lockdown policies? Yeah, that's a whole other question that will keep us here to 1.30. All I'll say is uh, what we've learned over time is very strategically directed mitigation strategies do seem to work. Um, and the lockdowns did work when they, were, when they were present, but then people had a, uh, the populations had, after a point in time, an upsurge. Uh, all the lockdowns worked strict as they were, but it wasn't a durable effect. And to get a durable effect, you suppress the virus and 
you vaccinate the population. And that's, the, that's really our pathway to success for the future. All right, Steve, we've got to move on. Yeah. We're, going to, we're going to go to Lisa at the Waterbury Roundabout. Thank you. Lisa? Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. We can. Hi, um, my questions have to do with um, not so much organized recreation, but unorganized outdoor recreation. We just got this nice new snowfall. And I'm wondering if there's any thought to sort of clarifying the guidance around people going outside to play in the snow, essentially, whether you're out in a snowmobile or you're gonna go skating or take your kids to a sledding hill. Um, there's a lot of chatter right now that I'm seeing where people are concerned about whether, you know, going to the same sledding hill with their kids and fanning out on sleds, et cetera, to go out at the same time. Is that considered a, a multi-household gathering if you've got your kids outside bundled with their faces covered on separate sleds and that sort of scenario? Yeah, I think, uh, again, I think that's all healthy and we should be encouraging any, anyone getting outside to recreate in those, in that manner and uh, just making sure that we're uh, masking up staying separated and so forth is is key um, but uh secretary moore can you uh, can you comment on this we've talked about this a little bit in some of our meetings yeah sure sure i'd be happy to up there we are working on on guidance to, to make some clarifications the last time we touched the outdoor recreation guidance was was back in the uh, late spring and early summer and so clearly thinking through but but just as you indicated um, it's, people need to, to observe those physical distancing uh, recommendations and, and be masked up. Um, but we, we'd love for people to, to be outside. Um, similar to, to the summer guides, so uh, this isn't a time for crowds and really encourage people to sort of arrive, play, and then leave um, and not engage in social gatherings, whether it's at the bottom of a sled hill or a trailhead or um, at any other outdoor facility. Right, well that's, that's definitely um, somewhat more clarifying and I think that that's helpful because it, it definitely is shifting now with the weather changing and there being different opportunities for people to get outside but also being dressed in a way that will be easier to, to have masks and face coverings, et cetera. So thank you for that. I guess we'll, we'll maybe look for that um, sometime soon, hopefully. Yeah, we'll, uh, we're, going to, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next, uh, either on Tuesday or Thursday. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I have a, a, a concluding question here. It's really just a question about clarification on the uh, on the vaccinations in the Group 1A for Dr. Levine. Uh, over the last few days, I've spoken with medical officers at both Gifford Hospital in Randolph and Mount Stutney Hospital in uh, Windsor. And it's my understanding from them that their vaccine allotments also provide for them to vaccinate EMS personnel in their respective catchment areas. And I'm just wondering if that is um, the distribution mechanism around the state. Is it to EMS personnel through hospitals? Yes, the answer is absolutely yes. It also includes uh, primary care, OBGYN offices, uh, dental offices. So um, a health alert notification uh, is either on its way out or going out this afternoon uh, so that all the clinicians and hospitals in the state <clears throat> will be aware of how to go about vaccinating those people who aren't really, really employed by the hospital but they're in the region of the hospital. And EMS is uh, high, on that, high on that list for sure. Okay, thank you very much. That's our fun thing. All right, we are through our questioners and thank you to Greg for uh, agreeing to connect with us separately about his follow-up questions. So that's okay, that's it. Uh, we'll see you on Tuesday. And then uh, uh, because of the, uh, the Christmas being on Friday, we'll have a uh, press conference on Thursday. So it'll be Tuesday, Thursday next week. Thank you very much.